I'm so excited, my brothers and sisters, to be blessed of the Lord to be with you today. I greet you with all the joy of Jesus I can muster. I am excited about what God is doing as we open up a message that I believe is life-changing. The message is called RSVP. I want you to get this word and may it bless you to drop all of your baggage and walk into your destiny without the encumbrances of where you came from. Now, my brothers and sisters, without further ado, I present to you RSVP. I think one of the most important things that our faith offers to us today is a resting place. A resting place that doesn't begin in the New Testament, but actually goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It is that resting place that David talks about in Psalms 23, when he braggadociously makes a statement about God that I so deeply appreciate. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth, he restoreth my soul. He talks about a place of rest where I can drink from still waters and find green grass, not because of my own strength and ingenuity, but because of the relationship that that I have with the shepherd himself. He describes me as sheep, uh, dumb, dependent, needing leadership, needing guidance, not to insult my intelligence, but to unlock the vulnerability that I have between me and God, that comparatively all of my wisdom is foolishness in the mind of God that I find myself engaged in a conflict so overwhelming that if God doesn't provide a solution for me, I will never get out on my own. I said, I will never get out on my own. Say that with me. I will never get out on my own. You'd be surprised how long you can live and not know that. (laughs) Keep thinking that you can get yourself out or you're going to find somebody who can get you out. Eventually, you come to a point that you recognize that you will never get out on your own. And after a series of bad relationships, you begin to realize that other people can't get you out either. You come to them with your problem, you find out that they have as many or more problems as you are. If you're broke, they're lame. (laughs) If you're distraught, they're depressed. Sooner or later, you recognize that all of us are carrying something that only God can lift up off of us. And so ultimately, you find yourself in a place where you need the Lord in your life in a significant and a powerful way. I'm going to rush through this message. Time does not allow me to do it justice. But there are certain elements out of this message that I think that you need to understand that are very profound and very powerful. I took the time to read Jeremiah because Jeremiah brings up an issue about the Sabbath that I would like to talk about for a few moments. He says that the Lord commands us to take heed to yourselves that we bear no burden on the Sabbath day nor bring it by the gates of Jerusalem. He said, I don't want you to bear any burdens. I don't want to see you up under a load uh, on the Sabbath day. I don't want to see you coming into my presence bogged down with things that would stop you from having a real worship experience with me. He said, don't bring things out of your house, issues out of your house where you are laden down with this issue and that issue, unable to unpack where you've been, where you've come from, walking along with loads of packages on you, your heart is overwhelmed. He says, I want you to come to the point of freedom in me. Somebody say freedom. Freedom. You must understand that one of the signs of the covenant that God had with Israel in the Old Testament was the Sabbath day. Now, I grew up in the Baptist church, in a very traditional Baptist church at that, and I grew up going to Sunday school and vacation Bible school. And when I went to vacation Bible school and Sunday school, they taught me about the Sabbath day. And there was a great debate going on at that time as to what day was the real day to worship God. That debate continues to this day and has existed all the way back uh, to the Old Testament, Old Testament theology as to what is the right day uh, to worship God. In spite of the fact that the New Testament tells us not to give respect of days, we're still debating over what day we ought to worship. I had run into some good friends uh, as a young man that were seven-day Adventists, and I still have a lot of friends who worship the Lord uh, on Saturday, which technically is the Sabbath day. And there was a great deal of debate going on with them as to uh, what was the right day to worship God. I have absolutely no problem with anybody who chooses to go to church on Saturday. Uh, I have no problem with that. I would never debate that. I would never argue about it. I can pass by the Seventh-day Adventist church and wave and respect and appreciate their right to worship uh, on Saturday, uh, probably because I also uh, worship on Saturday. Yeah, I do. 
I hope that does not exempt me from an opportunity to serve as your pastor, but I, I worship on Saturday. I always, ever since I've been saved, I've worshiped uh, on Saturday and, uh, and Friday and, and, and Thursday and generally on Wednesday too and, 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 and Tuesday uh, and, and Monday uh, as well and, and, and Sunday. Sunday also, I worship on Sunday. I don't have to come to a building to be in worship. I'm, I worship the Lord wherever I am and wherever I go. But there's a great deal of uh, debate about it. And I, I can remember that uh, my Sunday school teacher took me to the New Testament and showed me a scripture in the book of Acts that it said on the first day of the week, uh, they came together in the book of Acts. And she did that to make me understand that she said that the New Testament Sabbath was Sunday and that it was the New Testament Sabbath because it was a new beginning and that Christ rose from the dead on the third day and from the New Testament forward, uh, we should worship on Sunday. And while I respect that reasoning and that philosophy, I certainly fall short of making a doctrine out of that because I think that there is a deeper revelation. Uh, yeah, there, there's a deeper revelation. If you'll bear with me a few minutes, I'm going to pull a couple of threads and share some things with you that I think will be helpful to you. Uh, first of all, you must remember that it was on the seventh day in the book of Genesis that God ceased from his labor and entered into rest. He stopped working and entered into his rest in the book of Genesis. And the Bible says in the book of Exodus, there is no mention of the Sabbath day from the book of Genesis to the book of Exodus when God gives the Ten Commandments. And when he gives the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, he says, remember the Sabbath day, which looks back at the book of Genesis. And then he says the word to, which looks forward to the future. Remember the Sabbath day backwards to Keep it holy unto the Lord. In that statement in the Ten Commandments, we have a look backwards and a look forward. And I want to take a moment and glance back at what the Sabbath day was, and then I want to take a moment and look forward at what the Sabbath day is, and then I'm going to get to my text.